Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Giannis Meindl. I have the distinct honor of introducing this talk today. I'll hand it over to Laurie soon. Uh, I wanted to give a special shout out to, of course, Paul Gray, who organized this entire event today. Special thanks to Mr. Troll Greenblatt for uh, being at our school today. It's a true honor. And then a special shout out also to Sanim and Yajas here sitting in the first, in the first row uh, who were instrumental organizing their logistics. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Laurie, who's going to do our introduction. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome on behalf of the Hedge Fund Association. My name is Laurie Goodwin. I am the Chief Operating Officer. We are an international nonprofit trade organization devoted to advancing transparency, development, and trust in alternative investments. To be clear, our members work in various types of alternatives as well as, as at service providers. If you're interested in becoming involved, please join our ranks as we are a volunteer-based organization. Prior to introducing our speakers, I must reiterate our thanks again to NYU, my law school alma mater, and especially Giannis for his efforts to orchestrate this event. Now that the administrative issues have been addressed, it is truly my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Joel Greenblatt. He is the founder of Gotham Asset Management, a highly successful investment firm with more than $3 billion in assets under management. Mr. Greenblatt is the author of several highly influential books, including The Little Book That Still Meets the Market, and you can be a stock market genius, which are classics. In addition to his impressive professional accomplishments, Mr. Greenblatt is a well-known philanthropist supporting numerous causes, including education and health care. Our moderator is Paul Gray. He is the founder and managing partner of value-based investment firm Ironhold Capital and serves as New York Regional Director for the Hedge Fund Association. With that, thank you again, and I'll let you get started. Thank you, Lori. And thank you, Mr. Greenblatt, for being here today. It's a very nice pleasure to see you again. Pleasure. I think a very good way to get started is, can you please kindly tell our audience a little bit about your investment philosophy and perhaps how some of the greatest investors of all time have shaped it through the years, whether we're speaking about Mr. Warren Buffett or perhaps Benjamin Graham? Um, okay, well, uh, I went to Wharton undergrad, and that was back in the late 70s. And they were teaching us about efficient markets and didn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. Uh, back then, they had something called a newspaper. And you, it was printed on paper. And you could look at uh, the stocks uh, on all the different uh, exchanges. And, and they had something called the 52-week high-low uh, prices, you know, would show you the current stock price and then how high it's been in the last 52 weeks and how low it's been. And pretty much all of them said, well, the stock's now at $50. Uh, it's been as low as 28. It's been as high as 73. And my teachers were telling me that all those prices were correct, just, you know, a few months apart. Didn't make a lot of sense to me. I read an article uh, in Forbes, actually, about Benjamin Graham, and he had a little stock picking formula. Uh, and sort of explained his philosophy that said, you know, hey, there's this guy, Mr. Markin, he's uh, really the stock market, and it's very emotional. And sometimes it's overly optimistic, and sometimes overly pessimistic, and that made much more sense to me that, you know, the prices were a bit emotional than efficient at every stage of the way during the course of a few months. And so I read everything I could about Benjamin Graham, which, you know, I had learned nothing about in business school and uh, eventually read everything that his best student, uh, Warren Buffett, wrote uh, and really evolved from thinking about the world as uh, Ben Graham was, if I had to characterize it as, you know, figure out what it's worth, pay a lot less, leave a large margin of safety. Uh, Warren Buffett made a little twist that made him one of the richest people in the world. He said, if you can buy a good business cheap, even better. And, you know, luckily evolved fairly quickly towards good business cheap and uh, was off and running. I just found it fascinating uh, and, and really a lens to look at the investment world uh, that I still use today. I mean, it's, I think it's very complicated. You know, it's a, a stock market and the economy is a complex adaptive system and there's a million things that affect it. And you need a, a simple lens to, you know, cut through all the information and, 
And that's what uh, both Ben Graham and Warren Buffett gave me. And uh, then I read a lot of people who followed that philosophy, which at the time was called value investing. But once again, as I think uh, Munger said, value investing is also could be called investing. Uh, you try to figure out what something's worth and pay less. That's what you're trying to do. Uh, and it's, it's really no more complicated than that. The complicated part is figuring out what something's worth. And that, that's, that takes some work. But understanding what you're trying to do and trying to ignore emotion and what's happening in the short term and most of the noise that's out there, that's, that's really the key. Wonderful. And what do you think are the basic tenets of value investing? And why do you believe this strategy has endured for almost over a century now? Yeah, I, I guess I talked too much in the first question because uh, uh, really value investing is investing. Uh, the way I think about it is um, the, a factor like momentum, plenty of studies showing that it's worked, you know, stock that's gone up a lot continues to go up and you know, it's worked over time over the last 30, 40 years, uh, not just in the United States, but across the globe with maybe one or two exceptions. So no argument that over a long period of time, momentum investing has worked. But let's say it didn't work over the next two years. It could be that, well, you know, it's a long term effect and that we just have to be patient. Or it could be that, you know, a lot of studies showing that momentum uh, investing has worked and there are a lot of people with computers and not so hard to figure out. Stock used to be down here and now it's up here. And uh, maybe the, the trade, the momentum trades crowded and it's degraded and it won't work as well as it has over the last 30, 40 years. Two years from now, I won't know the answer to that question is, should I just be patient and wait it out or has it become crowded and degraded? Uh, and if I think of investing more as, look, a stock is not a piece of paper that bounces around that I put fancy, uh, you know, ratios on to figure out what's going on. I mean, basically it's a, an ownership share of a business that I'm trying to value and try to buy it less than it's worth. And it's possible the market doesn't recognize the value that I see in the next couple of years. But I'm not going to change my philosophy. If it doesn't work for the next couple of years, I'm not going to stop doing that. That's what stocks are. They're ownership shares of businesses that I'm trying to value and buy at a discount. And so it is possible it doesn't work for the next couple of years, but I'm not going to stop doing it because that's what stocks are. And, you know, I taught at Columbia for 23 years and I promised my students first day of class that if they did good valuation work, the market will agree with them. I just never told them when. Uh, but uh, eventually the market does get it right. It could be two weeks, could be two or three years, but eventually the market gets it right. And if you do a good job value, you, you will get paid for that. That's what stocks are. So it's really the way I think about things. Perfect. And um, can you also tell us about some of your most successful investments and how they exemplify your investment philosophy? Uh, yeah, talking about winners. I don't know what you learned from uh, looking at winners, but uh, I wrote a, a book called uh, You Can Be a Stock Market Genius. Uh, some people think it's called You Too Can Be a Stock Market Genius, but it's not called that. Now, that would be very conceited. I, I just wrote <laughs> You Can Be a Stock Market Genius and trying to lead people to the right uh, place. Uh, and I opened the book with a story about my in-laws who uh, used to have a house in Connecticut and they – uh, spent their weekends going to country auctions and estate sales and antique stores looking for uh, maybe undiscovered treasures. And if they found a painting that looked interesting, they didn't ask, is this painter going to be the next Picasso? They asked a very different question. They said, was there a painting buy the same painter in the same genre that recently went for auction for two or three times what I can buy this one for. Totally different skill set. One, you, ha you really have to have some chops to figure out that this person's going to be the next Picasso. And the other is just sort of finding something off the beaten path that, you know, is being ignored, uh, but 
there's some ways to check whether it makes sense that it's available at a good price. And I said that special situation investing, which is what I wrote about in that book, is, is more the second skill, not the first. And there's a big difference between the two. Not that it wouldn't be great to know who the next Picasso is going to be, but uh, that's a different skill set. And I found uh, looking off the beaten path for good investments or looking at something that other people are looking at or something that's uh, a little more complicated, so it takes a little more time, uh, you could apply a skill set and, and, and keep doing it. And so one of my best investments uh, going back some time, uh, I wrote up in that book was uh, Marriott was doing a spinoff. And that was one of the areas I, I, about a third of the book was about spinoffs, just looking at companies that were sort of being cast off. A spinoff is just when a company has several divisions and chooses a division to spin off into a separate stock because maybe uh, the value, it's not related to the first business, maybe the value is being lost. Whatever it might be, they're separating it out. So it's a new stock that hasn't been out there. It's not being sold to the public. It's just given to the current shareholders. And usually uh, it's given to shareholders that didn't buy that company. You know, they probably bought the larger division, not the little cast off division that is being. And so often these are being discarded. And we found a situation that was on the front page, actually, the Wall Street Journal. So it's, it wasn't very obscure. And it was a company called Marriott that probably most of you have heard of. And at that time, Marriott had a couple of businesses. Uh, one business, this is in the early 90s, one, one of the businesses was the business you're familiar with. It was hotel management business. And uh, they had a reservation system and they had a management company that uh, took hotels that were owned by other people and managed them and kept them to a certain quality and put them as part of their reservation system. And it was a very uh, a light asset business. Uh, that was a management business and very high returns and very attractive business. They owned another business that actually bought hotels themselves, a uh, very asset heavy business where you had to build hotels uh, and eventually they would sell them. And this was the early 90s and there was a, a, a real estate recession at the time. And they got stuck with a lot of these hotels that they had built in this other business. And they had a great CFO at the time who figured, you know what? That's an asset-heavy business that isn't nearly as good as the management business. Let's separate that out. All the debt was really associated with that business. Let's get rid of all that debt, and then we'll have an asset light, uh, low debt or no debt business left, and that'll be worth a lot of money. And so, of course, it was written up in the Wall Street Journal that they were going to do this, and I thought everyone's going to love this management business that's asset light, that uh, you know, has this great franchise that everyone knows mm -hmm. and what a jogger not that's going to be, you know, that it's unleashed from the bad business. So what did I look at? I looked at the bad business. So because there was a real estate recession, uh, there was a bunch of hotels with tons of debt on it and it wasn't really a great business. So I figured no one else would look at that one. And so I decided to look at that one. And the funny thing is when you read a 400 page prospectus, uh, at that time and still, not that many people do that because, you know, they either have a day job or a life and they, they don't really want to, you know, read through the 400 pages. Uh, but, you know, somewhere buried on page 187 was a chart that showed that uh, actually this spinoff, you know, the, the, the heavily indebted real estate business, uh, actually most of the debt was on a subsidiary that owned the hotels and they had a parent company uh, that didn't owe the debt that also owned assets. And uh, the stock was, uh, the combined company before the spinoff was at $24. And the good business was tr worth about $20, or selling about $20, and the bad business uh, was selling around $4, equivalent of the 24. Heavily indebted, uh, but once again, if you looked at it, the $4, uh, carefully, all the debt was on a subsidiary, and they had a parent with no debt, basically. And if you added up the assets, those were worth close to $6. So we could buy a business for $4 with no debt that was worth $6, plus a whole other business that had debt specific to that division uh, that wasn't going to impinge on the parent. Uh, and so, and that could be worth a lot of money or it could be worthless. I didn't know. 
because we were in a recession, but it had the chance to be worth a lot because it was so leveraged. But I, we could buy four dollars of a, uh, pay four dollars for a business that was clearly worth six dollars with no debt on it. I'm simplifying, but that's basically what we discovered. And one of the great things about um, portfolio management is, and, and a good lesson to to learn from this is. You don't really take large positions in things that you think are going to make 10 times your money or 20 times your money. Uh, really, we took big positions in things that we didn't think we'd lose money in. And so if you took a look at this division, uh, with you could pay $4, had $6 of unleveraged, meaning assets. You could miss by a little, but there was a margin of safety there, plus another division that could end up, if we came out of a recession, worth a lot of money. Uh, short story was you asked for a good one. So after f four months after the spinoff that we bought this division of $4, it went to $12, which you don't need, you know, a fancy calculator to know that's good. Uh, and we bought a lot of it, not because we knew it was going to be worth $12. We knew we weren't going to lose any money if we bought this and we were patient. So we bought a lot of that, and that ended up being one of the great positions. And it wasn't because we knew it was really going to be worth $12, but we thought maybe that's a possibility. So we had that sort of asymmetric opportunity. And that was probably one of the most fun things we did. And uh, another thing that Charlie Munger would say is, you know, if you have the greatest position that you've seen and you put 2% of your money in it, you didn't, and it quadruples or something, you didn't make a good investment. You made a stupid investment because you should have put 30 or 40 percent of your money into that one and so that's something to keep in mind it sounds simple but it's obviously not easy so i'm curious to ask with volatility being built into the market how do you maintain conviction especially in the short term when your investments work against you what do you guys do at Gotham capital so that's really a question asking uh what do you do in every investment because unless you bought at the all-time low the stock goes down after you or the investment goes down after you bought it, right? You either caught the exact low or sometime after you bought it, it's down. So just know that it's always going to be down after you buy it. I mean, unless you caught, you know, the low, which pretty sure I almost never did. So uh, it's good to know that ahead of time, that unless you're a lot better than we have been and every other investor, you're not catching it at the all-time low. Uh, and I guess one of the benefits of volatility is it gives you that opportunity. And one of the benefits of that is if the market weren't volatile, it would be easy and everyone would do it. And so you have to take pain and you have to have the psychological, uh, psychological wherewithal to think that you're right when the market is going against you, but goes against you almost every investment. Uh, so uh, I guess I got used to it. We had Monish Babrai on our show recently. He said the same thing. He said always after he buys it, it goes down the next day. He said he's just used to it now. Okay, I'll, I'll look what he's buying <laughs> and buy that. <laughs> How important do you believe management is to the success of a business? And what qualities and attributes do you look for when you're investing in given companies and operators? That's a great question, and I, I can't say whether, uh, you know, we used to go out and uh, meet lots of managements, and I always walked out. They always had a great story. Every management and usually got to be CEO of a public company or CFO. You're also probably pretty smart, and you always got a plan, and I wasn't that great at discerning, uh, you know, I said, gee, that makes sense, and they seem smart. Uh, but I found that over time, uh, really the best thing to do is look at what they've done, not what they've said. And so if management's been a very good allocator of capital, meaning when they invest in the business or they invest in other business, if they get good returns on that, you know, if, they, if their business is returning 30, 40, 50% returns on capital when they invest, uh, the best assumption uh, is to assume they'll keep doing that. And if they've invested and not gotten a good return, 
uh, the best assumption is to assume they're going to keep doing that. Uh, and mathematically, it can prove that's kind of true. Uh, we, we do a lot more uh, broad-based investing, and more quanti, so you can actually look at those kind of statistics and see that on average that is true, that managements are good capital allocators, continue to be good allocators. And no matter what the story is, if they've been bad allocators in the past, good guess that they'll continue to be bad allocators. Uh, management's really important. Another way to look uh, at management, and we look for every investment, is how is management getting paid? So if management is incented like you are as an owner, a part owner as a shareholder, uh, and they get paid a lot, if the stock goes up, uh, relative, and it's all relative, it's relative to what they get paid in their salary and bonus. If they get paid a lot more, if they're successful and they participate with you, that's really what we're looking at. We're not looking at some absolute number because, you know, these big companies, they don't own a big percentage of the company, but you can look at how important their stock incentives and ownership is. And I'd rather have ownership than stock incentive, which is kind of free, but both matter. <laughs> I look at how they're going to get paid. You know, for every dollar the stock goes up, do they make a lot more than they get every year? Are they getting most of their compensation from just keeping their job and, you know, and treat it like a sinecure? So uh, that's just another telltale sign. If your bread is buttered with them, uh, then you feel better about it. Um, and if management is getting options, exercising and selling, you know, I want to take another look and try to avoid those unless... There's some other reason why somebody else, another insider, is is uh, loading up and incented your way. So it's it's very important and one of the most important things, actually. Sounds like people have track records too, then, not just companies. Yeah, well, peop, uh, you know, management has a track record and they have an incentive. You know, you know my. Uh, Wife has a master's in social work, but I keep explaining to her economics and she throws it back in my face. People respond to incentives if you want to skip your economics course uh, and keep that one thought in mind. Uh, it's good for investing as well. That's Look how people are incented and that's how for the vast majority of them hacked. Beautiful. Obviously, growth investing has dominated the market in the last 10 years, but we've seen a recent pullback in the stock market, particularly in the tech sector. So I was curious, Mr. Greenblatt, do you think this is at all similar to what you experienced in your 2000.com bubble? And if so, would you recommend value investors jump in today or maybe not, not just yet? Okay, so once again, value investing is just investing. Uh, the value investing that uh, Russell or Morningstar would classify as value investing has had a you know low price book, low price sales. These are metrics that they use to discern, oh, you're a value investor. Uh, haven't done well. And often what we do is looking for things that are available at a reasonable price, uh, overlaps with that world, uh, you know, the, that factor type investing, even though that's not how we're getting there. In other words, if you were buying a whole business, which is the way we look at it, no private equity firm that's buying a whole business uh, says, I'm going to buy that business. It's selling at a low price book or low price sales ratio. I mean, they wouldn't even begin to look at that. They're looking at cash flow and, you know, but nevertheless, a lot of the things that we find that are attractively priced will overlap with the uh, Morning Stars or Russell's definition of value. And that's had a tough time. And uh, I'll just go back. I started Gotham Capital in 1985 and we ran outside capital for 10 years. We did very well. Uh, we were lucky enough to do well enough to return our outside capital, but keep our team. So we were still running money in 1998 when the market was up 28%. And we were actually down 5% that year. And it's hard to be down 5% when the market's up 28%. Or um, it's hard to live through that. And that was the first year we lost money since 1985. And then 99 happened and the market was up 21% again. And that was our second year we lost money. We lost 5% again. So it was two years in a row and up 28 and up 20, if you know, compound interest. 
that's bad uh, if you're down 5% two years in a row. Uh, the next year, the market was down 10%. We were up 115%. Uh, and I don't think we were idiots in 98, 99, and all of a sudden geniuses in 2000. We just finally got paid for the work we had done in 98, 99, and the market decided to pay us at a, at a different time. And I wouldn't say we have that dichotomy today that we had back then in the internet bubble, but I do think some of the opportunities rhyme. Uh, we have something, uh, we have a website called Gotham.com and we actually started posting, uh, we have a metric that goes back 30 years and puts together a portfolio of, let's say the cheapest 20% of the market. You know, if you look at the 1400 largest companies and we've done research on that, following that portfolio, it updates daily because prices change daily. So what's cheap, you know, rel you know, the value doesn't change of the businesses, but prices change. So it's updated daily to stay in the bottom 20%. Okay, the cheapest, the way we measure it. You know, it's cash flow oriented measure. Uh, right now, I haven't looked in a couple days, but uh, we're in the 93rd percentile for that portfolio towards cheap over the last 30 years, meaning the market's only been cheaper for that type, you know, the bottom 20%, uh, 7% of the time. And uh, when we've been here in the past, uh, it's not a prediction. It's just saying what's happened from the 93rd percentile in the past to this portfolio over the next couple of years. And on average, it's up 63% from the 93rd percentile. If you took a look at the S&P, that's in the 23rd percentile towards expensive. Still positive returns expected, but closer to 14 or 15% over the next two years, not 63%. Subnormal, but not negative. Okay. You know, it's expensive relatively, but, you know, average is 10 or 11% return. So that's pretty good. So subnormal would uh, get you to 14 or 15% over the next two years. And if you just bought the cheapest 20%, the way we measure it, uh, using the same metrics, uh, on average, that average about 63% over the next couple of years. So there is a dichotomy available to be had, as you would expect, when the rubber band stretches away from value you know, does it snap back? And, you know, if what I told my students for 23 straight years is right, uh, then, you know, eventually we'll get paid. Can't guarantee it'll be in a couple of years, but I'm, and I'm not making predictions. I'm just giving you data. Go, go enjoy uh, the data. It's, 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 but I would say this period rhymes a little bit with, uh, you know, that opportunity set that, you know, happened to us in 2000. Perfect. Um, you know, Mr. Buffett always says it helps to be a good business person when you're an investor or vice versa. And considering that you're one of the greatest investors, if not of today, but of all time, I was just curious to learn what attributes of business did you apply to Gotham Capital to make it the success that it is today, not only operationally, but as far as personnel, recruiting the best talent, and also in building the AUM. Um, any advice to the managers here today? I mean, the real answer to that question is I don't know. Um, uh, I will tell you where we've had success with the type of person that works with us. And we're really, uh, and, and what I've noticed, I've had over a thousand students over 23 years. And it, it really comes down to passion. Do you love doing this? Do you like solving Puzzles. I mean, I, I, to be honest, I tell my students, uh, you know, we go around the room the first day, you know, what do you think the value of being good at picking stocks or cheap investments, you know, it doesn't have to be stocks, uh, is. And, you know, they give me answers like, uh, you know, we make the market more efficient and, you know, allocate capital better and blah, blah, blah. And... I kind of tell them at the beginning, you know, market will probably, you know, market ain't that great at that. Number two, you know, it is over time, but short term, it's it's pretty crazy. And number two, it'll be fine without you. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what is the great social value to what you're doing? And by the way, what am I doing here teaching you? Because if I'm 
teaching you to do something I don't think has great social value. I'm even one step more removed from doing something with no social value. I'm, you know, whatever. And, you know, people, we could argue back and forth about it, but that's not important. Uh, you, this is a business that if you're good at it, you can get well paid and probably paid more than you're contributing. Uh, and so I asked my students uh, that if they are successful at this and that, you know, the classes help them or what they've learned in their own classes, other classes, uh, figure out a way to give back, figure out a way to contribute back because it is a real gift to get to do what you enjoy. And whether you think this brings a lot of social value or it doesn't, uh, there's a lot of good you can do with your success uh, and use some of those skills in other areas and some of the money you make in other areas. And I just said, do that. And uh, so that's what I asked them to do. I forgot the question. <laughs> what would you recommend to the emerging managers here today who want to grow their own businesses? What yeah. worked for you in Gotham Capital? Yeah, only, only do it for love, uh, that you really enjoy it. Don't do it for money. It pays well, so it attracts people who want to make a lot of money. And I don't notice that those are the people that are the most successful. Uh, it's really the ones, and like everything else, if you really love it, you'll be really much more likely to be good at it and to stick with it and work harder and and I've always loved the business and, and really enjoyed the challenge of it. And uh, I notice the people who are most passionate are the ones who are the uh, most successful and don't just do it for the money. There's plenty of, you know, if you're at NYU and well-educated, if you're in this room, uh, plenty of nice places that you can contribute uh, with those kind of skills and that education. Uh, so if you don't love this, do something else and contribute that way. And that's my best advice. Perfect. And on that note, uh, one of the things I admire about you, Mr. Greenblatt, is you're very generous with your fortune. You, you donate to a lot of charities here in the city. One that stood out to me is the Success Academy. Can you please tell the audience what spurred that and maybe share some of the statistics? I think they would really appreciate it. Uh, sure. Well, you know, as an investor, uh, always wanted to get the most leverage out of anything that, you know, we could invest in as a charity. I think of it as an investment as well. And, you know, although it's a cliche, you know, teach a man to fish uh, is a very valuable thing to do. If education is really the best way to help people help themselves. And it's probably the most unequal, uh, unequal thing that we do in this country. Uh, you're basically where you live is where you go to school. You know, I just, uh, you know, I always think of this analogy. Let's say that where you live determined where you ha had to eat all your meals. Okay. You had to eat in the same restaurant. So let's say there are a bunch of restaurants uh, with bad food, bad atmosphere, and bad service. Who the heck's going to live in that building that goes to the worst restaurants? And the only ones that will live there are the people who have no other choice, right? If it's known that it's bad food, bad service, bad atmosphere, only people who can't avoid it will, will live there. So we pre-select, and, and it's not just bad food and bad health that you would get from there. You know, it's, think of it as bad future or no, not a good, not a good opportunity for a good future. And that's the way we sort schools. The only, everyone is sorted. No one's going to live and, uh, in, a, in a neighborhood with really bad schools. Uh, and people pick where they live often. People with means pick where they live based on, you know, is my child going to have a good future, you know, and a good education. And we don't do that here. Uh, and so the idea behind charter schools is that for those people who don't like where they live, a charter school is a public school but you get in by lottery. And so could you build schools that were better than the public school choices that these kids have and give them a chance to, for a good education, regardless of where they live? And so, uh, and it's publicly funded. You have to get it started and there's all kinds of rules put in by the, uh, influenced by the teachers unions who have you know, or sort of have the vested interests. Uh, the rules are set up so that uh, 
when you set up a charter school, even though it's publicly funded, uh, if you uh, have more than 250 kids in your, believe it or this in New York State law, if you have more than 250 kids in your school uh, in the first two years, you're automatically unionized. So if you don't want to have union, you have to stay under 250 kids. But if you stay under 250 kids, you lose a ton of money. Okay? So what you have to do if you're opening a charter school is fund those few years through those losses before you get enough money to run the school. Uh, but then again, if you're successful, then if you figure out a model that can work with the public dollar thereafter, uh, that's a pretty good investment. You know, if you can keep the, you know, it might cost millions of dollars to keep the school open the first two years. But once you do, then you have a perpetuity and you have five, eventually, let's say 500 kids that, uh, and, and a good school. And so, uh, we sort of started success, uh, ended up hiring a woman named Eva Moskowitz, who was like hiring Warren Buffett to run your schools. We didn't know that at the time, but uh, that's really the only thing that uh, my partner, John Petrie, and I might take credit for is we hired the right person to do this. But the model was, look, if you hire the top one or two percent of teachers, you run out of those. That can't be your model if you want to replicate. And so the idea was come up with a model that you could replicate. And this is from our business training. You know, if something worked, the only thing that really mattered is could we replicate it? Not that we found the top 1% of teachers and made a great school. That's what a private school might be, you know. Uh, but how could you make a chain of schools? And so everything that we did from the beginning was how can this be replicated? So it really comes down to taking an average teacher and making them really good. Okay, giving them the tools giving them a prescriptive program that works that they can use to become really good. And uh, so it's started in 2006. So I guess it's 17 years in have uh, 22,000 kids across uh, 47 schools. And uh, on average, across those schools, uh, if you know what Scarsdale is probably, the, one of the wealthiest suburbs or the wealthiest suburbs. The kids in those schools are 87% uh, black and brown, uh, uh, probably 80 something percent low income. Uh, and uh, the schools on average beat Scarsdale and every other school district in the uh, state. So it's really shows what the kids can do if given the right opportunity for less money than they get in the public schools. So that's great and it's sad, right? It's great that everyone doesn't have this opportunity and that was part of the point. To see, A, to see if the kids could do it, how to do it. And uh, right now under state law, uh, there are no more charters available in New York City. Uh, that's a political thing. The governor's trying to lift that, uh, the legislature, uh, heavily influenced by politics, I won't say who, but you know, um, uh, is against it and, and for no good reason uh, that I can think of. So, you know, uh, still a lot of work to do, but at least we know that A, it's possible and that if given the opportunity, these kids can kill it. And uh, that's pretty nice to know. So it's been exciting to be involved. Like I said, we hired the right person to do it, and it's not easy. It's really hard, uh, but she's been incredible and built a system that works for these kids, and it's exciting to be a small part of it. I love that. It's an incredible story. Just to piggyback off of that, what do you recommend for the students here today? We have a lot of NYU undergrad and graduate students, and assuming they have the same passion, what would you suggest if they want to follow in your footsteps? Oh, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I... Uh, you know, the two things that I picked as leveraged way to help uh, is, is sort of uh, medical research and uh, education. And those are my two favorite areas. But I think whatever you're passionate about, there's so many places that need help and the smarts in this room. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to direct anybody. I'm telling you why. I, I like those. They're a very leveraged way, uh, a way to make a big impact and not sort of just give money, but 
sort of being involved that it could be a leveraged way uh, to spend time and money. Um, and uh, I don't want to uh, constrict anybody uh, who sees a, a, good op a good opportunity to help in a way that's meaningful to them. I think that's uh, just thinking that way uh, as early as possible, even if you're not ready, you know, if you're young, but thinking about, you know, you know, pretty much all you're going to be very successful. So, uh, you know, not, never too early to think about that stuff. Just a couple last questions. How has the investment management business changed since you first started? And what do you see for it in the future? Because to me, it seems like it's very saturated market. We have a lot of people concerned about computers and AI, although I don't personally think that's a concern. I think you share the same sentiment. I'm just curious to get your take on that. Well, there are definitely more computers and, uh, I think I don't know enough about AI because I'm super excited about it. So it could be really terrible, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, uh, but I would say, uh, and, and I'm asked this question every year. Uh, you know, I stopped teaching a few years ago, but for the 23 years I did teach, every year someone raises their hand and say, hey, Professor Greenwald, congrats on a great career, but you know, now it's more computers, more people. Uh, competition, it's harder, everything else. And I say, well, you know, uh, let's go back. Uh, I used to say, let's go back to 1997 when you guys learned how to read, but maybe some of you guys weren't born. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let's, let's look at the uh, most followed market in the world. That would be uh, the United States. Let's look at the most followed stocks within the most followed market in the world. That would be the S&P 500. And let's take a look at what's happened since then. And so I tell them from uh, 1997 to 2000, uh, the S&P doubled. From 2000 to 2002, it halved. From 2002 to 2007, it doubled. From 2007 to 2009, it halved. And from 2009 you know, uh, it's tripled and now it just fell, uh, 20 something percent. We'll see what happens. Um, and the S and P 500 is an average of 500 names. If, uh, you look under the covers, there's a lot of dispersion amongst those 500 names during that period. So if you believe what Ben Graham said that, you know, this horizontal line is fair value and this is stock prices around that horizontal line, sometimes too high, sometimes too low. And you have a disciplined approach to valuing businesses. Uh, still plenty of opportunities, and that's just the last 25 years or so. Uh, that's the story of the last 25 years or so. A lot of emotion. And the other thing I would say is no matter how much, con you know, think about it. There's not a lot of data over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, you know, for the last 30 years, there's 10 three-year periods that don't overlap to figure out whether some investment strategy or other works, okay? Yes, there's fast trading. There's a, you know, if you trade second to second, there's a lot of seconds in that 30 years where if you have a fast trading thing, those guys are going to compete that away. They have a lot of data. And I wouldn't go there because you need really fast computers and really smart guys and everything else. But the last man standing will be what's called uh, time arbitrage. And that means another word for patience, uh, you know, not looking, oh, am I going to make money in the next six months or a year? But, you know, sometime in the next year to five years, is this going to be trading for more? Am I going to get a good return? And can I be patient? You know, I will tell you, you know, I sat on numerous endowments uh, and endowments are perpetuities, meaning they should are supposed to be around forever and they should have the longest time horizon. Uh, fortunately, the big ones, uh, they have a guy or, uh, you know, a person who is in charge of, uh, you know, U.S. equities or bonds or real estate or whatever it might be. And they, their job is not a perpetuity. They have a benchmark. And if they don't beat it for the last three years, I'm not saying they get fired, but they don't get a parade, you know, uh, if, if they don't do well. And so, uh, you have an agency problem which is good for patient investors because you as an individual anyway, or you as a patient professional, uh, if you have that luxury, uh, have an advantage, uh, which is sticking to your guns and being more patient than everybody else uh, if you're good at it. 
Uh, and so that's not going away. That's actually that time horizon is getting shorter because uh, everyone you, everyone has a lot of data and it's available every day and every minute on your phone and uh, time horizons are shortening, not lengthening. And that's good news. And so that's where I'd look for my opportunity and that's not going to change. That's actually going to get better. So good luck. I know patience is the big secret, which was one of your recent books, which was phenomenal. So thank you for sharing that. And um, my last question it's was- It's a book that no one bought. It's <laughs> one they should though. And um, the little book that beats the market, of course. But my last question was going to be about a recent book I think you're writing or you're about to release soon. If you could just tell us a little bit about that. Uh, sure. I'm writing another book. I can't tell too much about it, but uh, one hint would be, uh, it's always said diversification is the only free lunch in finance. And I think I found a second free lunch, so I'm writing about it, and uh, I think it's going to be fun. So I'm excited about it. I love it. Can we give a round of applause for Mr. Greenblatt? Thank you. And before we break into questions, I just want to give a special thank you, thank you to Giannis Mendel and Lori Goodwin from the Hedge Fund Association for putting this together. So thank you very much. So we'll break into questions now if anybody has any. Henry? Can you hear me okay? Sure. Terrific. Thank you, Paul. Mr. Greenblatt, based on public records, from mid-80s to mid-90s, your firm, where you presided, generated net of expenses before incentive allocation at a whopping annualized 50%, which reminds me of, not myself, Warren Buffett. He did it from mid-50s to late, not eight, late 50s, then Mungo joined him in the early 60s, throughout the 60s. How did you do that? To be more precise, <laughs> what did you do to have such an impressive record? Not one year, not two years, but for a 10-year duration. Thank you. Uh, here's the good news. I might sell some books. I, I wrote a book about it. <laughs> uh, called You Can Be Stock Market Genius, and uh, it was really a, a collection of war stories about uh, the type of investments that we use to make that kind of money. I will say that uh, two tricks. One is after five years in business, we returned half our outside capital, meaning, uh, as Warren Buffett would tell you, a fat wallet is the enemy of high investment returns. Um, and so we returned half our outside capital. After 10 years, we returned all our outside capital uh, just to keep the job easier, right? You can look at many more positions if you don't have to pile a lot of money into them. You can look at smaller positions, more obscure positions, things of that nature. The other is concentration. Six to eight names were generally, we didn't take, we usually didn't use leverage, although we did buy options, uh, leaps and things of that nature, but didn't really use leverage. But six to eight names were 80 plus percent of our portfolio. Um, and so we were very concentrated. Uh, the third trick, uh, luck. Uh, when you're that concentrated, uh, you wake up and every couple of years, uh, your net worth drops 20 or 30%. And that just has to happen. That just always happens. It's never not painful. And, uh, so that's a trick. You have to live through that and, uh, be okay with it. Uh, so it's, I would say, don't run a lot of money, concentrated portfolios, take a lot of pain, get lucky. Uh, those are the four ways. Uh, we did it, but uh, the special situation where I would say we weren't ordinarily you'd say, oh, the more risk you take, the more returns you can get. Uh, this was really uh, taking unfair bets, looking for situations off the beaten path where we we're getting paid unfairly in an asymmetric way. We couldn't lose a lot, but we could make a lot. You know, I described Marriott was a a very fair example of getting lucky. Uh, you don't have to get lucky that many times, but you have to take a big position before you get lucky. And like I said, the biggest positions we took were when we didn't think we could lose a lot of money. Not that we thought we'd make a lot of money, but we could make a lot of money, but we knew we weren't going to lose a lot. And I think that asymmetry setup is really, uh, I would say, the biggest secret of uh, how we, we did that. But uh, Unfortunately, luck probably came in second, so, you know. Perfect. Uh, David? Uh, thank you, Joel, for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, 
I want to know how does Joel Greenblatt sort of manage the stress in psychology? You know, you talk about market volatility, you talk about the years where you kind of didn't do as well, maybe 1998, 1999. How did you manage that personally? How do you interact? Does that change your sort of everyday routine? Did you start working out more? You know, temperament is sort of intrinsic to value investing. So how did you sort of fortify that temperament? Thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. So I'll tell you a story. So when we first started in 85, uh, our first 15 months, uh, we were up 140%. And uh, I called up everybody I knew who I wanted to help, you know, family members, friends. Hey, you got to put in here. This is great. So we that took the money in. Six months later, we were down 17%. And I was ready to kill myself. It's, it's much harder to lose money for other people than it is for yourself. You know, you're sort of, or at least I consider myself a big boy, you know, make it back. But when you lose money for other people, it really hurts. Uh, it really feels bad. And uh, I don't have a secret uh, to, I, I felt terrible. Uh, you know, I just continued to work hard and, and try to do well. Uh, returned half the money. I said after five years, returned all the outside money after 10 years. Uh, and I only took outside and I couldn't square myself with losing money for other people very easily. I thought I could square it much easier for myself and my team who was in it with me. Uh, and it did take away about half the stress and I had a big family and it was nice to have half the stress. Can't take away all the stress. I mean, if it were so easy, you know, if there was some secret to take away the stress, that would be great. Uh, but I liked it enough to, I guess, uh, counter uh, the fact that it was always stressful when you're losing money and it's, and I would just say it's much worse losing other people's money. It just is. And so it's always stressful and it's part of what you're getting paid for. Uh, if you are in the other people's money business, you have to take that seriously. The reason we were able to take outside money again was that I wrote a book called, uh, the little book that beats the market, uh, just really showing a simple way to beat the market. And we didn't run the computer a thousand times. The magic formula in that book was the first thing we tried. And I said, oh, what a great example of good and cheap, you know, combining those two. And so I wrote a book about it because I thought it would be a great illustration. Uh, but I unfortunately got my partner and I thinking like, oh, well, we don't use crude metrics and we don't, uh, you know, we actually know how to value companies. You know, could we, use, you know, use this very simple thing to make a more uh, diversified portfolio? Now we own hundreds of names on the long and short side and I don't have that sort of stress and we let people pick how much, how long they want to be. You know, I don't have to say, oh, we should be 70% long now and 30% long later. People choose their exposure. So take some of that stress off me. You know, we're really filling uh, a gap for institutional investors mostly. And uh, so that more diversified portfolio is a little less volatile, uh, not as lucrative, uh, still fun because uh, they're both full-time jobs. You know, if I were starting again, I'd go back and do what I originally did. And people ask me, well, why do you do this more diversified investing? It's One's not better than the other. They're just different. They're using the principles that we always use to make money now. Uh, back then, it was a way to make a lot more money. And I love both methods. Uh, still, you know, I think they both work great. It's just different ways uh, to do it. And this is a little less stressful for me and, and still having fun. Perfect. Uh, the gentleman in the middle. So, Mr. Greenblatt, thank you for uh, taking the time here today, and uh, this story truly is inspirational. So, I think uh, a lot of us know a lot of the colleagues here, classmates, are going to be going to large financial institutions when we finish college, but at some point, a lot of us might want to start funds of our own. So, I guess, what's your best advice on what point in life you think would be ideal to do that, either age or point in career? You share some thoughts. Yeah, I don't have great advice there. I mean, you know, there's an argument for starting earlier rather than later uh, because sometimes it's easier to learn by doing and uh, you don't know. And, you know, depending on whether you have a family or not, it's very risky to start your own fund. Very hard to necessarily know that you're going to start off well. And so if you can afford to, you know, uh, be unsuccessful because you don't have a family, that, that's one of the benefits of starting early. One of the disbenefits is uh, I'm always learning. So, you know, I can't believe I started when I did, you know, and how much more I know now. Uh, and so, like I said, I got a little lucky. 
uh, because I probably did some stupid things that I wouldn't do now. And they ended up working out, but didn't mean they had to. So uh, I think you'll know when you're ready. And, and, and I think some people are better working on a big team and some people are better working on their own. And I think you have to read yourself. I think it's more like if you're enjoying what you're doing, set yourself up in a situation where you'll enjoy what you're doing. Uh, it, it's a little harder to go out on your own now uh, because it's a lot more regulation. Not opining whether that's good or bad. It's bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's harder and uh, less, and more, much more expensive uh, to do it well, you know, to do it correctly. Um, and so, you know, a few more impediments, more chairs thrown in your way before you get out there. But I, I think you should know yourself. Don't start too early. You, you need to learn. Uh, and uh, I had an opportunity. And, and for some of the things I was doing, it was a little bit easier. And, uh, and there was certainly less competition. So... And I've always had, I have a partner, Rob Goldstein, who joined me in 1989. And it's been nice having someone, a sounding board, someone to take the pain with, someone to make mistakes together and learn from and uh, make sure I've seen really great, and I mean great investors make very big mistakes because they sort of work alone and they're used to being right. And so no one tells them they're wrong. And, you know, for most of my career, I've had a partner, Rob Goldstein, with me to, you know, I tell him when I think he's wrong and he tells me when I think I'm wrong. And that's really valuable uh, because everybody's wrong uh, sometimes. And some people get right so many times in a row and they are really smart. But everyone's wrong sometimes. And you can be wrong in a big way. And I've seen it. And that's what happens. So it's nice to have backup. So that's, that's one piece of advice. All right, Sheldon, right here. I just agree, but thank you for taking the time. Um, I'm actually a Wharton undergrad here with a few of my classmates that came up to see you speak. Um, you talked about aligning incentives with the management team of the investments that you're looking at. I'm curious how you think about it from the LP's perspective, investing in you or your fund, or you know, how you think about aligning your incentives with their investors, and even for a fund manager like yourself, trying to invest in maybe smaller PMs or certain strategies. You know, how do you align that and just talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I would look at an, uh, a manager who has most of their money in their own fund. I mean, that's what we look at. Um, but when we were looking for individual managers to back, it was more, uh, you know, I've been grading papers for a long time. So if someone uh, writes an investment idea that I really think is great and they're passionate, that's how we pick managers, not... You know, we didn't pick them on track record because they didn't have track records, uh, the, the younger ones. We picked them on their thought process. And you can have a right thought process and a bad outcome. And investing is about the right thought process. Uh, doesn't mean you'll always be right. But if you think right, over time you'll, be, you'll do well. Uh, and so I think that's really the secret. I mean, once someone's had a great track record, they probably run a lot of money and Probably their best days are behind them. So it's always interesting trying to find someone who's going to have a good track record uh, that way. And so that, those are, we don't do that anymore, but that's the way we found good managers and we found some really good ones. Uh, and they're all, you know, not all, but I would say the vast majority ended up being really good people and very good partners. Alex? Um, so your book, You Can Be a Stock Market Genius? offers a truly legendary treatise on diversification. Uh, so I thought I would ask about your views on a different kind of diversification. Uh, we can call it time diversification. As the, pack, the practice of breaking up our purchases or sales of securities into multiple orders. Uh, large investment operations break up orders so as to not disturb the market. But what I'm talking about is breaking up orders purely for investment purposes. Is it better to break up purchases and sales to protect against the ignorance of timing the market or is it better to fire a lump sum when the price value discrepancy is extreme? Should the approach be different for great businesses than for cigar butts, given that great businesses are typically purchased for a higher multiple today, relying more on compounding for their margin safety, and therefore they fall more easily in the near term than cigar butts, which already sell for rock bottom prices relative to uh, current results? Yeah, yes, no, maybe. No. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that's a very uh, good question, but multi-layered. Uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm not a good trader, so I wouldn't ask me. Always good at buying when it was available at a good price. I would usually just take my position. Never was good at selling, uh, but I was really good at buying. Uh, you know, as a quote unquote value investor, I'm kind of cheap. And so, uh, I, I would say my general mistake is selling too soon, particularly for good businesses. As far as cigar butt investing and regular investing, uh, I don't cigar butt invest on purpose. Uh, if you did, it should be a trading strategy, not a long-term investment strategy. Uh, in other words, time is the friend of a good business and the enemy of a bad business. And so, you know, I, I like the margin of safety of that the, uh, you know, if you buy something that today is worth $5 and you think it's, I mean, that you pay $5 and you think it's worth $10, but that $10 is going down to $8 maybe over time. That margin of safety may be less than paying six dollars for something that's trading at uh, ten dollars. That's grown at twelve, fourteen, fifteen. The second one may have a larger margin of safety, so feel more comfortable in those. Lesson learned over time, uh, not not always observed, but lesson that I've tried to stay out of cigar butt businesses, not always successfully. Uh, so I never go into them on purpose, uh, and you know, hence looking at returns on tangible capital. You know, are we in a good business or not? Um, very hard to make it out alive in a bad business. Um, and investing is owning a business. Do you want to own for some period of time? It's very hard to trade. So ideally, you want to have a really good business that, compound, that can compound over time. And I think the more I invest, the more I learn that lesson uh, that you want to stay in what you think are good business. It doesn't mean you'll be right. Perfect. Just a couple something. last questions. Um, this young lady. Hi, um, Mr. Greg Glad. So thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm a reporter at the Institute of I'm also a Hawaii mom. So it's good to have um, to be back on the campus and hear your insights. So my question is, um, you mentioned that the market economy in the early 2000s disappeared um, recently. So I wonder what, whether you have made any recent adjustments to your value asset strategies to adapt to the recent market. Are you saying because uh, traditional value has uh, underperformed growth? Is that your question? So and have I made that, any changes as a result? So you mentioned that um, in the early 2000s, there was a market economy that really helped you underperform to achieve better results. But right now, this kind of condition no longer exists. So. No, what I'm saying is today, I see a situation that rhymes with what happened in 2000 where there's a dichotomy uh, and that uh, our definition of value is <coughs> has a great opportunity set, much higher than you know, owning the S&P. doesn't mean the S&P is negative. It just means the opportunity set and the way we value the bottom 20% of the portfolio, the cheapest companies, the way we value them in the top 1,400 is extraordinary. It's in the 93rd percentile towards cheap. And so... While I'm not expecting the dichotomy that we had between 98 and 99 and then what happened for us anyway in 2000 where, you know, reversed extreme, I think there could be a reversal that rhymes with it even though not as extreme. That's all. Perfect. Just one last question. Uh, this gentleman right here. Hi. Thank you so much for coming to the screen. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak to maybe the biggest challenge that you've encountered in your entire career and how that is really, I guess, what the lesson was that you've learned that shaped you both as an individual and as an investment professional. Mm. And I know that's a tall order, so. Yeah, it's tough to know. You know, uh, Malcolm uh, Gladwell wrote a book. I forgot which uh, one, but uh, he opens up, he opens it with that, uh, you know, uh, most of the hockey players in the NHL were born in January, February, and March. It's because they were born at the right time because everyone's uh, organized by uh, their age based on their calendar year when they were born. So it really matters when you're six, whether you were born earlier in the year or later in the year, you know, how big you are. And so they, they funneled the January, February, and March births 
into the special programs because they're bigger and and faster and everything else. And so uh, a disproportionate amount of professional hockey players are born in January, February, and March because that's – so they were born at the right time. And I came out of uh, business school in uh, 1980 and I went to one-year law school and dropped out of that. Thank God. Uh, and – in the beginning of the biggest bull market ever. Uh, so I haven't had that many investment challenges. Markets gone, you know, straight up. So I would say, uh, I hope my luck continues, uh, uh, and that it continues for you as well. Uh, because it's, it's been very good, uh, since then, uh, biggest challenges are really just, uh, Losing money and uh, realizing you made a mistake uh, rather than y you had a good process and it uh, didn't work out. I'm fine with that. The biggest I have is that we do make mistakes and we lose money as a result. And it wasn't because our process was right, but we had bad luck. It was literally we made a mistake. And sometimes we make the same mistake over and over again. It just looked different at the time we made it. You know, we try not to make the same mistake over and over again, but often it, it, it really is. And we get too enthusiastic about something, or we miss something that's, that's, that's really clear. So we took too big a position in something. And so, uh, continue to make that mistake. But once again, if you're not willing to take some risks, uh, you're not going to make, uh, the money and, and, I think one of the wisest things I heard uh, from an, an older gentleman, and I thought he was old at the time, he was 72, and I'm not going to say anything, but that seemed old to me when I was in my 20s, and now it doesn't, uh, you know. Anyway, uh, he said, you know, I was complaining about, uh, you know, boy, what bad luck I had on this investment. And he said, well, have you had any investments where uh, you got lucky? you know, and you didn't really deserve it. And I said, yeah. And he said, does it happen a lot? And he said, yeah, it's, it happens a lot. And so just, you know, you have to weigh the good with the bad is all I'm saying. And, and you're going to make mistakes. And even when you don't make mistakes, you're going to lose money. And you just have to, I think, be forward looking and learn, you know, whatever mistakes you make, learn from them and be forward looking. How am I going to apply them? And, you know, do as I say, not as I do. But in the rest of my life, I try to do that as well. I try to say, yeah, I really blew that. What did I learn from it? How can I do better? I think we all know that's the healthy attitude to do things. It's harder to do. So don't think I always do that, but that is good advice. So I'll probably leave you with that. Thank you very much.